Dr. Sange, welcome to Australia. Thank you very much. As a country, Australia values human rights and democracy. How do you feel about not being given the opportunity to meet with our Prime Minister as well as our Foreign Minister? Uh, with uh, Prime Minister, uh, we didn't make uh, the request. Uh, but with the Foreign Minister, uh, yes. Um, we thought it would have been better uh, had uh, we met the Foreign Minister, Honorable Bob Carr, so that uh, you know, he can uh, understand uh, the Tibetan perspective. After all, it's a Tibet issue uh, and Tibetan people's issue. So obviously, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's obvious that he meets with Chinese leadership and listens to their views, which is absolutely fine. Then uh, if he hears the Tibetan perspective also, then he might get more balanced view, and that will be seen as uh, fair. Uh, in that sense, it would, it would have been better uh, had I gotten the opportunity and apprised him of the situation in Tibet, because he does uh, reflect whatever he says will be seen as the uh, view of uh, Australian people and Australian values. Talking about the Tibetan issue, from China's perspective, it's not really an issue. If it's being justified on the international stage as Tibetan issue, then that gives other countries the perfect reason to attack China. So how do you go around that? You know, uh, Tibetan administration, uh, as per the view of uh, His Solness Dalai Lama also, what we seek is uh, genuine autonomy within China, uh, within the framework of the Chinese constitution, thereby not challenging China's sovereignty or territorial integrity. So any country or any leader uh, who wants to work with or have close relationship with the Chinese government then what Tibetans are seeking kind of fits in in this concept of one China. They are not disturbing or challenging uh, China's you know, uh, uh, sovereignty or territorial integrity. And then it's only fair uh, that uh, the, any leader from outside, even for the Chinese government, to agree to uh, giving uh, and respecting basic freedom of the Tibetan people. So that's how we put it on the table to the Chinese leadership and to the leaders around the world. And also, Tibetans have invested in democracy and nonviolence for many decades now. And I, I, I am uh, someone who got elected with the democratic mandate of the Tibetans. Uh, and nonviolence is uh, one principle that we really believe that we don't want to compromise. So if we are given the support and recognition, which means uh, uh, international community, including Australia, is supporting democracy and nonviolence. And if we are not given the support, then it sends a message that uh, democracy and nonviolence are not worth uh, investing in. And then it sends a message to other marginalized groups around the world who are watching and thinking, oh, if Tibetans are not getting support, then perhaps it's not worth uh, pursuing democracy and nonviolence as well. So that will be a, a sad uh, commentary uh, on the international community. From China's perspective though, if they grant the Tibetan autonomous region with the genuine, the genuine autonomy that you're seeking, then that means they're going to have problems with the Uyghur region, they're going to have problems with several of their other autonomous states. Yes, uh, that's Chinese perspective. That's more uh, Beijing-centric uh, interpretation. But if you look at uh, Tibetan perspective, um, and for matter, Uyghur or Mongolians, uh, China, that the map that you see of China, historically, Han Chinese lived in 40% of China. Even today, Han Chinese are majority 40%. The 60% of the territory of China has always been inhabited by Tibetans, Mongolians, and, and Uyghurs, and quote-unquote other minorities. Um, so in that sense, from uh, the uh, Tibetan point of view, you know, uh, uh, Tibet issue historically uh, has been distinct and different uh, from uh, Beijing-centric uh, interpretation. Uh, so uh, 
Tibetans, what we seek uh, is reasonable uh, for the uh, Chinese government uh, as well. We're seeing um, the recent spate of very tragic self-immolations happening. Since 2009, there's been over 40, and more than 30 people have died. But the majority of these people are young people who've never had a chance to meet with the Dalai Lama. So what do you think is actually causing this increase in such self-destructive acts? When the um, Chinese army first moved to Tibet in 1950s, they promised, quote-unquote, socialist paradise for Tibetan people. Now, these people, the 40-plus uh, Tibetans who have self-immolated, are, in that sense, is a socialist paradise generation. They grew up under Chinese communist system, political system, education, economic system. They are, in some ways, product of and beneficiary of the Chinese government uh, uh, policies. Now, the fact that they are protesting to the extent giving up their lives through self-immolations by setting themselves on fire, clearly demonstrate that the Chinese government policies is not working. And there is so much resentment among Tibetan people. They are there giving up their precious lives uh, in protest against. Now, as the Tibetan administration, we don't want to see such drastic actions. And we have made repeated calls to, Tibet, to Tibetans inside Tibet not to resort to drastic actions, but they continue to do so, which means they are really, uh, really desperate. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the oppression is so uh, strong, um, they're saying, you know, we will protest uh, this way, uh, which, as you said, is really sad and tragic. From China's perspective, though, it's not really helping with your fight for a genuinely autonomous Tibet, because they're calling the Dalai Lama, as well as his associates, including yourself, a terrorist organization that's campaigning for um, the disintegration of China. So by people actually taking such drastic measures, it's not actually sending a very good message to China. Yes, both the points, are, I think, uh, you know, uh, are not correct. Uh, number one, uh, by labeling us, you know, like you said, uh, they give us many colorful labels. Um, but that's the, what they always do. Your Solonist Dalai Lama is recognized as global statesman, Nobel Peace Laureate, and he is also labeled as demon by the Chinese government. And uh, it did not work, uh, and it will not work. Any label uh, they try to, you know, uh, project uh, to me or to His Solonist Dalai Lama. Because the uh, whole, whole world knows that what we seek is through a nonviolent uh, process, which means a peaceful process, and uh, they, thereby alleging that we want to split the motherland. As I said, we want to find the solution within the framework of the Chinese constitution, thereby, in fact, you know, uh, providing uh, protection to China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. So to allege that we want to split the motherland it's simply unfounded. But then uh, they keep uh, repeating those kinds of labels and allegations, and the world is not buying it, the world will not buy it. And the reasons why they are protest is because of the policies. They can end all the protests in Tibet tomorrow if they open up uh, Tibet, if there's some uh, you know, uh, basic uh, freedom provided to the Tibetan people. So what are you asking for when you talk about genuine autonomy within Tibet? We believe in nonviolence, means we want to solve the issue of Tibet through dialogue. And middle way is the policy. Middle way means devoid of both extremes. Uh, neither we want to split the motherland, nor we want to seek independence. But what we want to seek is genuine autonomy within China and within the framework of the Chinese constitution, which means as per the Chinese laws. If the Tibetans are granted a genuine autonomy. It's like saying if the Chinese government implements their own laws, that could amount to autonomy for Tibetans. So all the Chinese government needs to do is implement what is written in their constitution. If that happens, what would happen to your role as political leader of the Tibetan government in exile? For that, I think we have made it very clear uh, since 1992. The day we solved the issue of Tibet, 
our rule, the administration in Dharamsala in India, will be dissolved and we all will return as private citizens. So I'm happy to give up my political responsibility the day Tibetan people inside Tibet get their basic freedom because they are our primary concern. Our role is secondary. We are playing this role because we are, uh, we have to uh, be the spokesperson uh, to reflect and represent Tibetans inside Tibet. What will be the biggest challenge for you to achieve this goal in this lifetime with the Dalai Lama now 76? So that means the time for the next Dalai Lama to come to this world will also happen very soon. So that means there, there could be a few years of window where you will be fighting on your own. Is it a big challenge for you? Uh, it is obviously a big challenge, as it is any movement or any cause is a big challenge. Um, now, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama is very healthy and he will live very long, that's what we believe. Um, and he also made it very clear in September that, uh, and, and, and it was endorsed by Tibetan Buddhist leaders, that he will have the final say on who uh, the next Dalai Lama will be. Now, my biggest role will be uh, responsibility is to uh, keep the Tibetan solidarity and Tibetan spirit inside and outside strong. Uh, as long as we do that, we keep our hope alive and, uh, and then we can keep uh, moving forward. Now, so far, uh, I did not work that hard on that account because uh, Tibetan inside Tibet, their sense of patriotism, uh, their uh, commitment and determination for the Tibetan cause is very, very strong. Um, and it's expressed through uh, various means in all the time. Artists are composing songs, uh, and the monks are praying, and lay people are also offering, uh, going to temples and offerings for long life of His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, myself also. Uh, so Tibetan spirit is very strong inside, and Tibetan spirit is also uh, very strong outside. Now, I have left America, left my job at Harvard after 16 years to return to India and serve uh, the Tibetan people. And others have joined me uh, in this uh, mission and many, many more Tibetans will come and join uh, the Tibetan cause and we will be there. So although it's difficult, but then support is very strong from inside and outside Tibet. The obvious issue though is a lot of Tibetans within China who still feel very, very strongly to bring back the Dalai Lama, they're aging. Whereas the younger people are increasingly assimilating into the Chinese culture. That's also happening outside of China itself around the world with your six million Tibetans in exile. So how do you keep the relevance of your administration in order to keep on pushing your goal of a genuinely autonomous Tibet? Fortunately, um, even though uh, there is an attempt by the Chinese government to assimilate Tibetans, but very few intermarriages uh, are happening between Chinese and Tibetans. Uh, in that sense, I think Tibetan identity is still uh, very strong and distinct uh, from the Chinese. Now, uh, Chinese government uh, also attempts to uh, take young Tibetan children to uh, Chinese schools in China and educate them and send them back to Tibet. But then when they go to uh, China proper, it seems the Tibetan children are also realizing that they are really different uh, from Han Chinese and awareness and consciousness of the identity is more uh, alerted. So they come back, uh, uh, at least many of them, as more Tibetans. Um, so in that sense, I think uh, uh, Tibetans inside Tibet are doing uh, quite all right so far in the last 50 years. And as far as Tibet outside Tibet, mm, again, uh, because we are in a free country, our sense of Tibetan identity and consciousness uh, is really mm -hmm. strong. Even though I've never been to Tibet because I was not allowed to, but I firmly believe uh, that I am a Tibetan and I'll die as one. Uh, and while I live, I'll work for Tibet. Uh, that kind of commitment is not just uh, me as an individual, but collectively, our generation of Tibetans think like that. So we can see that the Dalai Lama has been very influential on the world stage as both the spiritual as well as the political leader of Tibet. But obviously for you, the new player 
it's different because you have the political brand attached to your role without the spiritual brand. That means you're going to face a more challenging role in terms of getting access to world leaders. What do you think you can actually achieve in this lifetime that the Dalai Lama has not been able to achieve in the past 50 years? <coughs> um, on the one hand, uh, what you are projecting could be true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in many sense, the uh, Tibetan cause is stronger now because the Solonist Dalai Lama as a global statesman will travel around, meet world leaders, and I continue to do that. He'll meet more world leaders. Uh, then I, for one, uh, has to play the political role. And now we have two, uh, you know, uh, at world stage. Even though uh, I can't fill in the big shoes of His Solonist Dalai Lama because, uh, you know, he's a Nobel laureate and a global figure, I'm just uh, in many sense starting in my role. But I have the democratic mandate uh, of the Tibetan people uh, because they voted and elected me and I have more votes than any Chinese leaders who claim to rule or uh, who claim leadership over uh, Tibetan people. Uh, in that sense, the international community, at least where uh, democracies prevail, uh, should look at me and say, hey, he's from uh, the same background as us and accordingly uh, uh, treat uh, us uh, uh, with uh, some kind of acknowledgement, if possible, recognition. Having said that, the movement can be uh, you know, uh, dealt at at a formal level, at the leader's level, and at the people's level. And Tibetans, we have always valued um, people's role and people's support. And uh, that's why whether I get meetings with uh, uh, government leaders or not, I will continue to meet with people, uh, very uh, supportive people of Australia and people around the world. Uh, it is always a people's movement, you know. So I'll continue to do that. And uh, we have gotten support and we have kept alive the issue of Tibet for the last 50 years. And we will keep it alive for another 50 years if necessary. Um, so in that sense, we will be stronger down the line. China has assigned its own Panchen Lama. Do you think in the future, if it assigns its own 15th Dalai Lama, do you think that will be the last straw for Tibetans around the world? It will be not because the Chinese government should have realized by now uh, their mistake uh, in appointing uh, another Tibetan boy uh, as quote-unquote Benchen Lama when His Holiness Dalai Lama's endorsed Benchen Lama, Gendun Chik Nyima was already there. Uh, because spirituality is something to do with your heart and mind. Um, it is about belief and faith. Uh, our spiritual leader, His Holiness Dalai Lama, has endorsed the Pension Lama, Gintun Chokinyima. He will be our Pension Lama. Unfortunately, the Chinese government's attempt to groom and prop up uh, the other boy, uh, unfortunately uh, and expectedly, will not be recognized by uh, uh, Tibetan people, and that Beijing knows it very well. So, by attempting that, uh, they are undermining their own credibility. An attempt, any attempt on the uh, next Dalai Lama will be not recognized because Communist Party of China, you know, says religion is poison, and they call His Holiness Dalai Lama a demon, and they call him splitist, give all kinds of names, and now they're saying we will recognize the next Dalai Lama. That's like you know Fidel Castro saying I will recognize the next Pope, and Catholics around the world will accept him. That's not going to happen because our faith and loyalty is with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, and whoever he appoints or designates, uh, the next Dalai Lama will be recognized by Tibetans, and accordingly and hopefully by people around the world as well. Dr. Lopsan Sange, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.